You're listening to In the Balance, an Iowa Judicial Branch podcast. Welcome back. Beginning February 1st, 2021, jury trials resumed in Iowa after being postponed during the winter months due to an increase in COVID-19 cases. The safety of jurors participating in trials during COVID-19 has been a priority for the judicial branch and led to the creation of the Jumpstart Jury Trials Task Force shortly after the COVID-19 pandemic came to Iowa in 2020. Today, we will be talking to co-chairs of this task force, Justice Matthew McDermott and Attorney Guy Cook, as well as Jasper County Trial Coordinator, Amy Dredge, about the steps being taken to protect jurors, judges, and all parties involved in jury trials across the state. Justice McDermott, thank you for joining us again today. We talked in December about your role as co-chair on the task force in charge of resuming jury trials in the midst of this pandemic. Can you tell us more about the makeup of that task force and what other voices were a part of the jury conversation? Sure. Uh, Good to be back with you today. Uh, So the Jumpstart Jury Trials Task Force was started in early May, and it, it started by court order. And at that time, uh, jury trials were set to restart, I think, in mid-July. And uh, we ultimately wound up uh, having to push that date back a bit farther. But uh, the task force that we put together was uh, an attempt to try to get a very broad mix of voices uh, from folks who were involved in all facets of jury trials. So... The task force included uh, district court judges, criminal defense lawyers, uh, criminal prosecutors, uh, civil lawyers on both the plaintiff and defense side, a district court uh, clerk, district court administrator, uh, the state court administrator, uh, judicial branch IT director, uh, a court jury trial manager, a court reporter, Um, We tried to think about everyone, frankly, who is involved in jury trials uh, in our court system and tried to get a a representative from uh, pretty much every facet. And one of the things that we were looking for, frankly, wasn't just the input from that person on an individual level, but people who could solicit feedback from others and kind of widen the net and gather even more input in this process. And speaking from a judge's perspective, what were some of the main concerns you felt district judges would need addressed for their courtrooms to allow the resumption of safe jury trials? Well, the the goal of what we were trying to do was to protect the health and safety of all the all the participants in trials while upholding you know, the fundamental legal rights and protections owed to the parties and to the public. And so you know, the district court uh, you know, process that we have for our jury trials, it brings together members of the, of the public of diverse ages, diverse races, in an indoor space for an extended period of time with participants that have to speak, or at least many of them have to speak throughout this this process. And that's obviously a problem when you're dealing with a virus that can spread sometimes through speaking or being in, in close contact. And so what we were having to deal with was 99 uh, different counties with courthouses of all shapes and sizes, recognizing that there was gonna be a, a, a very big space issue that we had to deal with. Um, particularly for selection of jury members. You know, you can't have 30 or 40 people in a, in a courtroom. And then just thinking through the trial itself with having to spread people out in a way that we never had previously, accounting for all of the sight lines that we had to make sure, you know, everyone that was, that was there could see what was going on and then being able to hear it all. So we had to, you know, amplify audio or find ways to make sure that people who were distanced and then speaking through masks were able to actually hear what was going on also. And so it obviously presented a number of challenges for us that we had to kind of figure out how we were gonna make it all work. 
So what can jurors who are either called in for selection or who are selected for a jury, what changes can they see in the courtroom when the trial is set and begins? So logistically, there's going to be quite a bit different for a jury member in, in terms of how the setup is now based upon how it was previously. We're obviously providing for physical distancing for everyone in our in, in our courtrooms. So we have to spread everyone out. The jury box, which previously held, you know, 12 or 14 people, uh, now is typically holding, you know, two, three, or four people, depending on how many we can get, get spaced in there. The gallery, where members of the public previously sat, uh, now is largely filled with jury members. And so we, we, we have everyone spread out. Um, everyone has to wear a mask. As many courtrooms are going to have plexiglass dividers. Um, there's going to be you know, exhibits often done by video now um, instead of by paper. We're obviously pushing for less paper handling, less uh, contact with people within six feet. They're going to see in the courtroom and in courthouses a lot of markings, a lot of signage. Um, they're also going to see uh, air purifiers in many courtrooms, portable ones that uh, we were able to get through the, the CARES Act. Um, many of them, many of our courtrooms are now better equipped with video equipment and um, microphones and things like that. And so the process is gonna be a little bit different. At its core, of course, it's, it's, it's gonna be the very same thing. They're gonna come in and they're gonna hear the testimony of witnesses. They're gonna have to judge credibility. Um, they're gonna have to you know, analyze the facts of the, of the, the case. Um, so the, the core features are all going to be there, um, but it's just going to be different because, uh, and it has been different because people are spread out quite a bit more and everyone's wearing masks and um, there's, I, I would say, a little more going on with presentations by video, particularly the exhibits mm -hmm. as opposed to, um, you know, paper. Another large part of this task force mission is letting Iowans know about all of these steps that are being taken. This podcast is one example of spreading that information, but if somebody wants to learn more about these precautions and what they can expect when called in for jury duty, um, where can they find that info? So uh, iowacourts.gov is our court website, and the very first thing that you see when you go to that is a lot of information about COVID-19 and the orders that we've put out there. The full task force report that we issued, I think in late June is out there. It's a somewhat lengthy document, uh, but we have a number of court orders that uh, kind of flowed from that, from July, August, uh, September. And so uh, um, folks can, can uh, find, I think, a lot of information out there uh, in those orders. We also have a really good video uh, in which Kevin Cooney, who's a retired newscaster here, details and kind of shows uh, what courtroom changes uh, now look like. And so I think that, that that's a really good video for members of the public to look at to get a sense of what we've had to do um, to make changes as we've moved through this, this process. Great. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. Guy Cook, thank you for being with us today. You work as an attorney in Iowa and were a co-chair on the Resuming Jury Trials Task Force alongside Justice McDermott. How did you approach and tackle the COVID-19 safety concerns as someone who has participated in trials as an attorney rather than, say, a judge or juror? Sure. Well, the task force was created by uh, the Chief Justice, who was really forward-thinking, uh, trying to get out in front of this issue. Uh, we were well ahead of a number of other states in addressing the issue. The task force was, of course, made up of, of lawyers and judges and court administrators from around the state, as well as public uh, health officials. The focus that I had, and uh, along with some of the other attorneys, was ensuring that whatever safety pr protocols we put in place did not impact uh, negatively the process because at its core, a trial is a search for the truth. And so uh, while we want to ensure that the participants are 
uh, involved in a safe way, we want to make sure that those safety protocols didn't negatively impact the process. And the, uh, the safety concerns dovetailed well with the search for the truth. One of the concerns that we had was that in picking a jury, people would be afraid to serve on a jury because of their concern about COVID. And if we reduce the jury panel, the pool of which jurors are drawn from, there was a risk that the jury that was ultimately picked might be skewed in some way. To put it another way, the bigger the jury pool, the greater chance that we'll have a good cross-section of the community to hear a case. And so we didn't want people not to come to be considered as jurors because they were afraid of COVID. So uh, implementing safety protocols, very important to ensure that we didn't somehow uh, corrupt the jury panel in the scope of the jury panel. And then secondly, uh, to the extent a trial is a search for the truth, which it is, uh, we were very much concerned about how these protocols might impact the jury's ability to judge truthful testimony, to make credibility decisions if there was some distance away or if the participants were masked up or that there was something that would impact their ability to judge credibility. And uh, so that's how the face shields came into be. That's how the protocols involving plexiglass came into be. Uh, the one thing that we found out, though, from the pilot trials and from some of the trials that proceeded is that our concern about uh, persons being masked up maybe was uh, greater than proven out because one of the things that happens is Sure, you can judge credibility by seeing someone's facial expressions, but there are that impact uh, judging credibility. And we were pleasantly surprised to find that merely because persons had masks didn't necessarily negatively impact the process. Testifying, uh, you folks have maybe seen photographs uh, or the video uh, sitting at a witness chair with a plexiglass or wearing a face shield. Facial features were visible. For attorneys preparing for jury trials now in the time of COVID-19, what insight can you give them regarding changes in courtroom proceedings and conduct and even interactions with their own clients? Right. So one of the biggest changes, of course, is picking the jury and having that spread out and having bigger panels. In some districts, that's been done away from the courthouse in bigger settings. Uh, in some districts, it's been done in another courtroom and using the entire room. So the jury selection process is, is different. Uh, the uh, process of ensuring that a record has been made uh, obviously is impacted by either wearing a face shield or mask. So, uh, because the court reporters are challenged in that they cannot see the lips move, but probably the biggest issue, and this is true more in criminal cases, perhaps than civil cases is the dynamic between the lawyer and their client and being able to confer closely as the trial is proceeding. And so uh, obviously a lawyer and the client can decide that they wish to, to communicate in a way as if there was no COVID uh, or that they can ensure that they fully vetted their conversations and issues outside of the courtroom or the, uh, you know, the process can be done, you know, with legal pads and, and notes back and forth or digital communication back and forth. Is there any changes that are made in the way that attorneys can interact with jurors in the courtroom when giving evidence or um, testimonies? Well, the, you know, the jurors are more spread out um, and, um, and the lawyers are, you know, socially distanced or physically distanced. Um, but we've been surprised to learn in the, in the pilot trials and in the trials that have gone forward that that process has not really been impacted all that much. Um, it's more, as I said earlier, the process of picking the jury um, because you ha that's when you have the greatest number of people collected that you have to take steps to ensure that the protocols are followed. Uh, the, uh, the jurors that have served in the trials that have, have gone forward uh, almost universally have, have uh, given positive 
commentary and remarks on the protocols and how the process went and that they were able to hear the evidence, hear the lawyers and make decisions. Lastly, what message would you like potential jurors to take away from this interview and about the work that's been done through the Serving Safely Task Force? Potential jurors can rest assured that the task force has worked hard to ensure all the proper safety protocols are in place. And that's in consultation with public health officials. And we've tested these in the pilot trials and the trials that have gone forward. And they've worked. And uh, the trials have proceeded. The task force put a lot of work into ensuring that people can be safe and feel safe. And that's proven to be true in the trials we've had thus far. Great. Thank you so much for taking the time today, Guy. Okay. Thank you. Amy, thank you for joining me today. You are the trial coordinator for Jasper County. Can you tell me what your job duties typically entailed prior to the new COVID jury guidelines? Yes, thank you for having me. So prior to COVID, we did not have to worry about social distancing and we were able to fit the whole jury panel in the courtroom for jury selection. I would have the jurors report in the morning for jury selection and they would typically go through the whole process in one room. Jurors were able once selected to utilize the jury box and the jury room for breaks and deliberations. Great, and Jasper County recently now held a jury trial under these new COVID protocols. So how did your role change within these new COVID guidelines? Yeah, since COVID, we have had to implement social distancing, masks, shields, and sanitizing surfaces during jury selection and trial. We have jurors spaced out and due to limited space, some jurors we have in separate locations in the courthouse during the jury selection process. And potentially even we have um, our panels coming at different times um, and we do jury selection and shifts to allow for proper social distancing when higher number of jury panels are required. Uh, For example, we would have one panel come in at 8.30 and then have a second group come in later that day or sometimes even the next day. The jury selection process would be conducted separately to get one jury selected. We are also using technology to stream the jury selection process to other rooms within the building so jurors can still see and hear the judge and attorneys even if they are not in the same room. Um, some counties are even using larger off-site venues so they can accommodate larger jury panels in one room. Um, we are also using text and email to notify jurors when they are to report or if they are not needed in an effort to try to limit the jurors time spent in the courthouse. Our um, main goal is to ensure the safety of jurors while they are serving on jury duty. Can you walk me through then, if an Iowan is called to jury duty now, what they can expect to see or prepare for before coming in and then during that jury trial process? Yeah, when a juror reports for jury duty, they must wear a mask. If they don't have one, we have one for them. And they're also provided a shield for use during jury selection. Um, Jurors will have signed seats that are marked and spaced out six feet during selection. If a juror is excused during the selection process, we sanitize the area before a new juror would take the seat. Uh, We also have hand sanitizer available in multiple locations around the courtroom. Jurors will also see some plexiglass in the courtroom where six feet separation is not possible. During jury selection, the attorneys and the judge will use microphones so the jurors in the back of the courtroom can hear. Once the jury is picked, and the jurors who were not selected leave, then we sanitize the seats again before we reseat the new selected jurors um, for the duration of the trial. Attorneys, they have been using large projection screens or TVs for viewing of any of the exhibits instead of passing them around. Um, And during deliberations, the jurors are allowed to deliberate in the courtroom since there's more space. Great. And now, now having been through uh, a, a jury trial during these times, have you received any feedback from jurors about the experience with these new guidelines? 
Yeah, the jurors I talk to have really appreciated the extra steps that we have implemented to ensure their safety, um, including, you know, sanitizing everything and having hand sanitizer available. So far, the jurors' biggest concern has been being able to hear during the jury selection process because they're so spread out and sometimes in separate locations. Um, to help with this, we have made some improvements in our technology for streaming, um, better microphones, stuff like that. And we are working hard to make sure everyone is able to see and hear the proceedings while still being at a safe distance. Fantastic. Thank you, Amy, so much for taking the time today to walk me through this new jury trial process. You're welcome. Thank you. You've been listening to In the Balance, an Iowa Judicial Branch podcast hosted and produced by me, Marissa Gall. If you would like more information about Iowa's courts, you can visit www.iowacourts.gov. You can also follow the Iowa Judicial Branch on Twitter and YouTube at Iowa Courts. This episode of In the Balance is now adjourned. Until next time.